Okay, I'll call this meeting to order. Thank you very much, and I apologize to the public for us being late. We were caught in traffic, and thank you very much for coming out this afternoon. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? No? Okay, so we're, um, we have a quorum, and I'd like to call this meeting of the Budget Subcommittee. Scarborough Civic Center <coughs> consultation meetings to order. This meeting is one of a series of meetings that are happening across the city to hear public deputations on the 2019 capital operating and rate supported budgets. Welcome to members of the committee and members of council and of course to members of the public and the media. We acknowledge that we acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Metis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and Williams Treaty, signed with the multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa uh, bands. You can follow the meeting on your computer, tablet, or smartphone at www.toronto.ca slash council. These sessions are also being videotaped. Where's the deputation list? This is updated, so just go by this name. Oh, okay. Okay, so the first deputant, and I want to remind members, uh, you have five minutes uh, to make your deputation. Our first deputant is a May Ma from the Toronto Environmental Alliance. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for pronouncing my name correctly. I really appreciate it. Um, I recently joined the Toronto Environmental Alliance as executive director, and I'm also a resident of War 19. As you may know, the Toronto Environmental Alliance, or T, has 60,000 supporters across Toronto who want to build a greener city for all. We closely monitor environmental decision making at City Hall and participate in the budget process every year. Earlier today at City Hall, my colleague Heather Marshall deputed on the rate supported water and waste budgets. I'm going to focus my deputation on Transform TO, Toronto's Climate Action Plan. I participated in the city's modeling advisory group that contributed to the development of Transform TO. Those of us who have been involved in this strategy are not only committed to its emission reduction targets, but also to its focus on social equity, health, and prosperity. It is designed to leverage and contribute to important city initiatives for poverty reduction, tower renewal, and transportation, and proposes actions that will bring tangible benefits to people's lives. Now it is the time to realize the plan. Residents need to see the city can turn plans into meaningful action. As such, I would like to propose the following recommendations to this committee. Firstly, Please commit to funding the Transform TO budget proposed by the city staff. The current request of 1.45 million or 1.31 net represents the bare minimum needed to move the strategy forward. Based on the city's own plans, Transform TO should have a budget of 7.8 million by 2019, and the current request only brings us to 5.4 million. The strategy is essentially one third underfunded. So far, Toronto has hit its GHG reduction targets, but that's because we've picked all the low-hanging fruit. We cannot continue to coast on the closure of Ontario's coal-fired plants. 
To hit the council endorsed target of 65% reduction by 2030, we need to move forward to deeper action and that's gonna require much deeper investment than what's in front of you today. We need to turn our attention to retrofitting all of our old buildings and get the city off fossil fuels through electrification and renewable energy. This requires major capital investments from public and private funding sources. Secondly, council needs to prioritize building retrofits and jobs for those who need it most. The Transform TO Acceleration Campaign, Workforce Development for High Performance Buildings, provides a huge opportunity to invest in a triple win. Reducing deep emissions and providing healthier, healthier affordable, and weather resilient housing conditions and job creation. Half of Toronto's emissions come from buildings and the city has committed to retrofitting 100% of existing buildings by 2050 and all new buildings by 2030. This is an opportunity to create a highly skilled workforce that includes equity seeking groups facing employment barriers. There are organizations and businesses that are well positioned to help deliver this work, but the city needs to get the workforce strategy off the ground. The commitment to retrofitting Toronto community housing must urgently move forward to create healthy, dignified living conditions for residents. Our schools and shelters must also be given top priority. Retrofit funding for all these buildings has been cut by the provincial government this year, unfortunately. I want to flag up that the current budget proposal reflects a delay in hiring five staff positions to help with retrofit programs, which will delay progress. Council should be ready and willing to fund these positions should staff come back with a mid-year request. Thirdly, Council needs to prepare for deeper investments. As highlighted in my last point, strategic investments in climate action can generate social and economic benefits. However, it does require that Council raise funds to make these investments. Council must take decisive action to address the city's revenue problem. Our city is in a state of poor repair. Both our physical and social infrastructure are at their breaking point. We cannot kick this can further down the road without facing dire consequences. If the city is not raising adequate funds from traditional revenue tools for climate and other critical social investments, it must explore new innovative approaches. For example, Portland has instituted a clean energy community benefits initiative a 1% big business surcharge to pay for clean energy projects and job training. We request that council direct staff to explore innovative re revenue generating options for climate investments. Can you please wrap it up? Yes. Lastly, the city cannot do all of this alone. We are in this together and we need to engage residents from every corner of the city in actions to both prevent dangerous climate change and build community resilience. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? No, thank you very much. Thank you. I would just like to acknowledge the members of the committee, first of all, which is uh, Councillor Brad Bradford and Councillor Jennifer McK uh, McKelvey. And as well, as I'd like to acknowledge Councillor Lai that's here as well and Councillor Kerjianis, and also acknowledge the mayor that's here. Welcome. Uh, at this point, before we continue, I would just like uh, to make a motion and uh, that speakers who have not pre-registered for the 3 to 5 p.m. session of the Scarborough Civic Center consultations be allowed to register to speak until 4 p.m. February 7, 2019, after which no further registration is allowed and the speakers list will be closed for the 3 to 5 p.m. session and then we'll continue for the evening session. So that's my motion. All in favor? Carry. Our next uh, deputant is Gideon Foreman. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, and Mr. Mayor, appreciate your being here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, this afternoon. My name is indeed Gideon Foreman. I'm a transportation policy analyst at the David Suzuki Foundation. We're here today to thank Council for its support for active transportation and to urge the committee to increase funding for protected bike lanes so the 10-year cycling network plan can be completed ahead of schedule. Increasing this funding would be popular because public support for bike lanes is widespread, Madam Chair. Polling done by Ecos Research in 2018 found the lanes are endorsed by 82% of Torontonians. This support is not confined to the downtown. Ecos found bike lanes are backed by three out of four residents right here in Scarborough. Nor is enthusiasm for the lanes confined to cyclists. Ecos found the lanes are endorsed by 75% of people whose main mode of transport is the car. 
Ecos also asked Torontonians if they want the cycling network completed according to the current timeline or if completion of the network should be sped up. 65% of residents, nearly two out of three, favored an accelerated pace. So if you increase bike lane spending and build the cycling network ahead of schedule, it should be popular with your constituents. What's the appropriate level of spending? One way to answer the question is by looking at what other cities spend. Take Montreal. That city dedicates about $16.6 .6 million a year to cycle paths. This amount may sound familiar. Yes, it's approximately what Toronto has committed annually for its cycling network. But here's the catch. We have a million more inhabitants than Montreal. That means Toronto's per capita spending is far lower, about $6 per resident versus over $9. So here's our ask. Please make our per capita spending the same as that of our Quebec friends. That would put Toronto's commitment to bike lanes at approximately $25 million annually. At that level, we could complete our cycling network far sooner, <coughs> in about six years rather than 10, while improving road safety and potentially saving lives. Let me be clear, Madam Speaker, we're not asking you to outdo Montreal or race past them. We're just asking you to match them, which means giving bike lanes just $9 per Toronto resident. Are bike lanes an urgent priority? We think so. As you know, they're a key component of Vision Zero, the city's plan to eliminate road-related injuries and death. And the lanes do more, Madam Chair, than simply protect bike riders. They also benefit drivers. Research done on Bloor found that following installation of protected lanes, far more motorists felt comfortable driving beside cyclists. Perhaps this explains why support for bike lanes stands at 75% among those who rely on the car. As well, bike lanes make a lot of economic sense. You'll recall, Madam Chair, the Richmond and Adelaide lanes, which Council wisely voted to make permanent, and thank you for that, were installed for just $780,000. These lanes now boast over 6,000 cyclists per day, more people than use some subway stations, such as Downsview Park or Highway 407. So for a tiny fraction of what we spend on subway stations, we can move thousands of Torontonians on cycle tracks. That's cost effective. In conclusion, we ask you to slightly increase our per capita bike lane spending so it matches that of Montreal. Doing so would fulfill our vision zero commitments much sooner, helping to reduce grievous injury and death on our roadways. New funds for cycling would also prove popular with your constituents, both in the city core and here in Scarborough, who said they want the cycling network completed ahead of schedule. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Uh, questions? Councillor Kerjanis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Indeed, it's a pleasure to hear about bike lanes and, and the network that you want to expend. However, that costs money. And I'm just wondering, should the um, bicycling, bicycling community also contribute to that expense? Well, Councillor, I think we all, all of us who live in the city contribute to that. I mean, um, through our, through our property taxes, through uh, other ways that we contribute to the city. So I, I don't think it should fall just on one group. I guess our view, Councillor, is that the cycling infrastructure benefits all of us. It makes the road safer for all, and therefore all should Agreed. contribute. But, I mean, for me to go register my car, I have to pay, and some of that goes in order to look after roads, road maintenance, uh, the shoveling of, of the snow. Uh, by bicycling, although it takes people out of cars, and it's a good thing, um, what contribution a person that has a bike makes about shoveling the snow on the bicycle lane? I mean, last April when we had the snowstorm, we bicycled, we cleared bicycle paths downtown faster than cleaning sidewalks on Finch. And my people on Finch were slip sliding away where downtown people on bicycles had an opportunity to, 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 to ride free. Don't you think that we should share the, the burden like? And people I, that I, are actually on the bicycles and they should contribute something about us maintaining these bicycle paths and the clearing of the snow and everything else? If the question, Councillor, is should we, as a city and as in, uh, citizens of the city, share the costs, we certainly should share the costs. And to the extent that cyclists are also property tax payers, myself, but many others, we, we do uh, all contribute to paying for those appreciate things. That. I appreciate that. I really appreciate it. But a person that has a car, he pays a licensing fee for the car. And part of that money, as I said, goes to... Now, we all pay our fair taxes, and certainly you do and I do. But however, because I ride a car, I pay extra. If you ride a bicycle, you're getting a free lunch. Hey, um. Should we not share the burden? 
we should share the burden. I guess we don't agree that it's a free lunch, okay, uh, Councillor. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Um, Councillor Bradford. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you okay? Okay, okay. Councillor McKelvey, go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. You mentioned that the bike lanes are an important component of Vision Zero. Uh, I was wondering, do you think that we should also be looking at them in terms of carbon and carbon savings and including that, uh, linking it with Transform TO so they're you, really merging together? Absolutely, uh, Councillor. An excellent point. Uh, the bike lane network, the cycling strategy are crucial pieces. Uh, as you know, transportation is a huge source of uh, GHG emissions in the city. The work that I do, in fact, on cycling is as part of the climate work that I do with the foundation. So the connection is obvious and absolutely needs to be made. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. Do cyclists pay property taxes? Well, I'm a cyclist and I do, uh, and lots of us do, yes, sir. Do we use property taxes to pay for things like road maintenance, snow removal, things like that. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Our property taxes go to contribute to all the good services that we get here at the city. Do we use property taxes to pay for plowing sidewalks? Yes, we do, sure. Do we have licenses for pedestrians using sidewalks? We, not to the best of my knowledge. We okay, as, a site, as a pedestrian, you don't need a thank you. <laughs> license. Thank you very much. Our next deputant Thank you, Madam Chair. is um, Ann Purvis. Hello. Um, I'm speaking for the Toronto Field Naturalists, whose mandate since its inception in 1923 has been the protection and appreciation of nature in Toronto. We are here today to ask for a multi-year dedicated funding to save Toronto's ravines. The ravine strategy passed by Council in September 2017, has as its overarching goal the protection of ravines by maintaining and improving ecological health. We are asking for funds to make this happen, and we are not alone in our request. Over the last four weeks, 2,391 Torontonians have signed a petition asking for dedicated funding to save our ravines. Torontonians overwhelmingly value our ravines. They love the access to nature, and rightly so. The City of Toronto's Biodiversity Series notes that Toronto is home to thousands of native species, birds, bees, butterflies, plants, mammals, and more. For many people, Toronto's ravines are the only way they can afford to connect with nature. So, for a city that cares about equity, ravines have that vital role of bringing nature to everyone. Torontonians also understand the ecosystem services ravines provide, carbon sequestering, air filtration, flood control. Ravines are the lungs of Toronto. Ravines provide vital existing services and we should be investing in them through budget 2019. Torontonians participate in land acknowledgements every day. We participated in one at the beginning of this meeting. Funding the ravine strategy is a way of making those acknowledgements real. Till now, um, <clears throat> the ravine strategy has been funded in a haphazard and insufficient manner. Our ravines are under intense pressure from erosion, invasive species, climate change, and inappropriate use. If our ravines are to be saved, dedicated funds must be set aside now and earmarked for ecological health. That's what the ravine strategy is all about. Here are three things that must be done. Number one, we need to protect the best bits of our ravines first. They are called environmentally significant areas. The city mapped 80 of these more than a decade ago, but they are not safe because there are no management plans. We need a budget that can deliver management plans for every ESA. Number two, we need to agree on tools to measure and report on ravine ecosystem health. Without these tools, we are working blind. We need a budget that will fund a system of measuring and reporting on ravine health immediately. Number three, we need to empower volunteers. Many capable and accountable community groups in this city are already dedicated to protecting and restoring the ecology of our ravines. The TFN alone has many ecological restoration professionals, botanists, biologists, horticulturalists, stewards with decades of experience. They're all chomping at the bit to make a difference, yet these volunteers sit idle because the city has insufficient staff to harness their potential. 
the city's natural environment community program and community stewardship program are poised to take the lead and facilitate training and oversight. We need a budget that allows these teams to staff up and grow to meet new responsibilities and expanded efforts. In summary, members of the Budget Committee, we ask you to allocate some real dollars and target timelines that will protect Toronto's ravines, focusing on three immediate priorities, protect the best bits, firm up the monitoring toolkit, and harness the volunteers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, Councillor McKelvey. With the reduction to 25 councillors, the city restructured the committees. Do you think that it was a smart move to move infrastructure and environment together? Do you think that our ravines are green infrastructure? Um, in some ways, it's probably, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on these matters, but I think that it's always a conflict between um, big capital projects and ongoing investment in things like invasive species removal and protection of, of what we already have um, and planting projects. And so to me that, um, that creates a scenario where there's going to be more intense conflict between those two things. But do you think that if we invest in ravines and in our green infrastructure that will decrease the pressures that we have on our sewer systems, for example? Oh, I'm not sure if I understand no. you. Oh, that's okay. Um, so I, I did look through I mean, what I've, was in the budget for the ravine yeah. strategy, and it looks like this year there will be prioritization <coughs> because we have many ravine systems, so we have to look at the prioritization. And something that I did ask TRCA to do, and so I wanted to let you know that, mm -hmm. is to say what is the cost of not investing in the ravines um, because they are important um, for protecting erosion and water just like you speak to. So um, I think that that prioritization needs to happen. And do you think that's, that we need to know which ones to go after first? Yeah, um, TRCA um, it has a responsibility for the ravines as well. Um, they're provincially funded um, and they, um, they are interested in those issues of flood control and that's where they're focusing. That was what they originally got interested in ravines for. But the issue of biodiversity never comes up at a TRCA meeting. They're not interested in the, um, and many of the things that TRCA works on um, it, are not particularly impacted by um, invasive species. Um, but the issue of biodiversity and the, the wealth of biodiversity that Toronto has and that is our natural heritage to protect um, is the city's responsibility. I mean we have to take that up because TRCA um, doesn't. Okay. So, so you think that I mean, should be I part of the strategy going forward? Okay. Sorry. So I think the ravine strategy was passed by the city and its focus is ecological integrity, ecological health of the ravines, which is preserving and conserving its biodiversity. And that's the city's, I think that needs to be the city's focus. Let TRCA look after the, the big capital flood control projects and stuff. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Councillor Bradford, question? Oh, sorry. Thanks, uh, thanks for the deputation. I uh, appreciate it, the, um, the three points that you kind of brought forward as next steps. Um, the third one where you talked about empowering volunteers, um, mobilizing volunteers in the ravine strategy is something that uh, keeps coming up. And um, I had a, a budget meeting on Tuesday night and somebody mentioned this as well. Do you have uh, any thoughts on how the city might help support and enable that? Absolutely. It, yeah. yeah um, my experience is that there's a real bottleneck there um, that the natural environment community program and the community stewardship program just don't have enough staff. They can't let people go into the ravines and just do their own thing, you know, pull out weeds and whatever. They have to supervise it. It has to be according to a plan that the city has got for protect for improving ravines. Um, and so they have to supervise groups of volunteers and there's lots of groups that want to help and there just isn't any staff to do that. So the, the community stewardship program has had a very limited number of groups um, that have done an amazing job like at Milne Hollow and uh, places like that, um, Cottonwood Flats, I know of uh, many of these, uh, several of these, um, but they're, and if we're going to, um, get into all the ravines and, and really make progress, we've got to have more staff to supervise more groups of volunteers, basically. Or 
staff to train, like some people have suggested a certification program where volunteers could actually be trained to lead stewardship groups and get a certification from the city that they are, although not city staff and not paid, they're actually qualified volunteers. So that's another uh, possible direction it could go. Okay. Thanks very much, Anne. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I can ask, before we go to the next deputant, I'm told that we have um, a deputant that has two small babies with her. And if you mind, if we can just bump her up and, and allow her to speak. Uh, her name is Chelsea Goldie Braun. Is that okay with the, uh, with the deputy? Thanks Thanks very Chelsea, much for five minutes. Me. Okay. <clears throat> it's okay. Hi, I'm a Scarborough um, resident. I've been uh, born here. Um, I grew up at Warden and Lawrence, and I spent my teenage years at Port Union and Lawrence. Um, and now I'm raising both my kids in Oak Ridge in Scarborough Southwest. And I really love this city, but I've been so disappointed lately, and I've been so disappointed specifically in this budget, which is a continuation of uh, a lot of things I'm worried about. Um, people, are making <laughs> people are making more money than ever in the Toronto development, real estate, rental markets. And I see more people being left behind and more people struggling than ever. Both of those things are occurring at the same time. An unacceptable number of people are dying from homelessness and violence, and housing is a crisis. We continue to be the child poverty capital of the country. That's embarrassing. And yet, this budget prioritizes keeping property taxes at inflation and well below if we look at over a long period of time. It's well below what inflation would have brought it to by this point. And no new sources of revenue. None of the planned services or programs to address the real problems we're facing is being properly funded. Everything that makes the city wonderful, our libraries, our rec programs, transit, parks, they're being underfunded chronically. The growth is stagnating and in some cases leading to disrepair. I just want to ask what you want your legacy to be as our leaders of this city and our representatives. Do you want to look back at this point as the time Toronto continued to decline because of a lack of investment? I'm from a working class family. I'm a nurse. I work part time, nights and weekends because daycare is very expensive and budgeting is tough. But I can say right now, I could pay more. I could pay more in property taxes. I could pay a vehicle registration fee. And there's so many other places you could get more revenue. You could put levies on development. And I'm, I'm very tired of hearing things being unaffordable yeah. or that it'll scare off investment. The demand for housing is out of control. You're not scaring off the investment here. And property hacks, tax hike of 10%, which is way higher than you've put in the budget, would cost the average homeowner 20 to $30 a month extra. 
that's affordable and it's not your job to be popular it's your job to do what's right for the city and explain why we need the things that we need and it's also fiscally responsible because prevention is better than worrying about crises after they happen paying for our shelter system right now is more expensive than dealing with poverty to begin with that has been proven time and again so why are we not doing that as a priority? Why are we not funding childcare properly? Why are we not funding poverty reduction properly, the youth strategy properly? I really hope you can be brave and be bold this time and actually help the people who need it most and lift up those people. I want to see Toronto community housing repairs. I want to see more supportive housing and I want to see affordable housing be a, a percentage of the income, not the market rate. I want to see shifts from crisis response and respite to lasting programs, mental health, addiction services, employment services. I want to see childcare and youth programs that are actually being prioritized. And I really want to see everything that I love about the city get better and I don't want to see people being left behind. Thank you. Um, if, if I can please tell the audience to, to not applause, please. Uh, questions? No? Thank you very much. Our next deputant is Gillian Mason. Madam Chair, members of the Budget Committee, members of Council, Mr. Mayor, staff, um, fellow residents, thank you very much for this opportunity to present to you today on behalf of the Centre for Connected Communities. My name is Gillian Mason. I'm an advisor to the Centre for Connected Communities, and I am here today with Ajeev Bhatia, who is next on the list to speak, but we thought we would put ourselves together, who is uh, the manager of policy and uh, community connections at the Centre for Connected Communities. Our subject today is employment and poverty reduction. Specifically, we are proposing an innovative, demand-led approach so that when local jobs are created, local people, people living in poverty will benefit. And so that when local jobs, when employers are creating jobs, they will be able to find the skilled labor that they are looking for now and into the future. So we'd like to share with you a proposal. Um, I'm not sure we submitted copies. I'm not sure if they have been passed around. I'm not sure who the clerk of this committee is. So, Grand, you have them? Very good. Yes, we do have a copy. Thank you. East Scarborough Works is the proposal that uh, we've got in front of you. It's a prototype of a new skills training center. It uses a demand-led approach to employment in an area of Toronto, specifically East Scarborough, that is experiencing higher than average levels of poverty, an area where approximately 30% of people live or perhaps survive below the poverty line. 16% of youth are unemployed, and an area that's been significantly affected by job losses in Scarborough over the last decade. So the notion that you have in front of you, the proposal you have in front of you, emerged out of two and a half years of research, a project that was funded by the Local Poverty Reduction Fund of the province. It has broad support from across sectors, from employers, through trainers, through residents. It is in line with the momentum that is building to embed community benefits agreements in a large public infrastructure projects and would help you to fulfill your poverty reduction strategy, your Toronto Strong Neighbourhood strategy, and also speaks to your social procurement policy for which you now have a blueprint. What we're talking about, Madam Chair, is an approach to employment, not a new employment program. Let me explain. We are in a perfect storm of opportunity. We have a high proportion of people living in poverty right next door to a huge public investment. The University of Toronto at Scarborough is contemplating spending $500 million in the next few decades on their expansion plan. And we know that there are private manufacturers in Scarborough who are, are screaming for skilled labour. Yet our research shows that there are very real barriers to employers finding the skilled labour that's right on their doorstep and barriers to job seekers landing and keeping those jobs. 
So we plotted the pathway that someone would need to follow in order to get from poverty, underemployment, unemployment on a pathway, and that's in this proposal second to last page. And if you look at the page before that, what you see is the broken version of that pathway, which is what we are looking at at the moment. And what we realized was without the improvement to that pathway that leads from poverty to opportunity for a job seeker, the jobs that are being created at the University of Toronto at Scarborough, the Scarborough Health Network, the Toronto Zoo, might as well be on the moon rather than right next door. Our research also helped us to understand who the leaders were, the key players, in this continuum from looking for a job through to a good job at the University of Toronto, for instance, or with a manufacturer. And we brought 100 of those people together in a room at the Guild Inn in November. And we asked them to roll up their sleeves and work together to figure out how to, to smooth this pathway. And in that room, we had employers. We had UTSC, someone from the president's office at the Scarborough Health Network, the head of the zoo. We had unions. We had contractors associations, residential and sewer and water main contractors. We had trainers, essential skills trainers, employability trainers. We had employment services, Toronto Employment Services and, and Employment Ontario representatives. We had wraparound supports. We had people who, the, the wraparound supports, the folk who provide um, assistance for people living in precarious situations. Politicians, funders, Metcalf Foundation, United Way, et cetera. And most importantly, we had residents, residents living in poverty. They kept the conversation real. We had the 100 people sitting in tables of 10 with one of each of those uh, people fulfilling each of those roles at that table. And at every table was some uh, resident living in poverty. Um, much like as the woman who has just uh, described, there are some very, very tricky situations people find themselves in, in particular youth. And the reason I've asked Ajeev to join me here is because you, uh, Ajeev, is going to tell a little bit about his own history with respect to living in poverty in Scarborough. Thanks, Jillian. Um, so I've lived in the Orton Park and Lawrence neighborhood my entire life, up until very recently. Uh, and myself, along with all of my peers, lived um, under the low-income cutoff line. Even though we were five minutes walk away from local employment services and supports for young people. And this disconnection in East Scarborough and this experience of disconnect for youth in East Scarborough is something that my grassroots organization found as well through our community-based research that we've done. It's a common experience that all young people are experiencing here. <clears throat> now as a manager of, uh, pol of policy and community connections at the Center for Connected Communities, I'm looking at this opportunity for the East Scarborough Works model as an approach to connect young people like me to employment opportunities right in our own neighborhoods. Right, uh, using a neighborhood and place-based approach to be connecting people in East Scarborough to jobs in East Scarborough and providing wraparound supports for the most marginalized people in this community, like myself, to access training, access demand-led employment, and then sustain employment afterwards. So I please um, uh, ask you all to consider uh, the strategy uh, quite seriously. So eloquently put, thank you, Ajeev. Um, in summary, East Scarborough Works, uh, the proposal that we're leaving with you, is a prototype of, as Ajeev has said, a place-based system to address the problem of poverty and unemployment in East Scarborough by leveraging what are significant public investments in the same communities while meeting the needs of employers now and into the future in finding and keeping skilled labor. Thank you very much. We're happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Councillor McKelvey. Thank you for that presentation. Can you speak to the support that's behind this idea in Scarborough? Thank you very much for that question. In, in part, the two and a half years of research um, that we undertook, we, th we took it upon ourselves to actually speak to the range of folk who may be interested in this. And that led us down two paths. One was to talk to employers, universities, unions, skilled trainers, contractors, et cetera, and slowly but surely understand why they were or weren't involved in uh, smoothing this pathway. And what we now have is the broadest level of support in my 30 years in the nonprofit sector I have ever seen for a single kind of initiative. But also, uh, quite independently of this, the Scarborough Community Renewal Organization brought together about 170 people uh, representing 20 community associations for an all-day summit last April. 
And of about the 15 ideas that were posited that day, the overwhelming support from that group of community associations was in support of the creation of a skills training center in the recognition that there were jobs that could be being filled by people in Scarborough um, and that this was a, there were already policies in place to encourage that, but there were really no mechanisms to ensure that people had the skills that they needed. And so a re uh, request did go to the mayor from uh, the Scarborough Community Renewal Organization. As I recall, the mayor was very favorable to the idea at the time. And um, can you speak to how this can help to solve social procurement issues? Because a lot of times employers want to hire locally but find that challenging. One of the very interesting findings for us was how little each of the groups knew about each other. The university wasn't really aware of the employment organizations that were working down the street. The unions that are very squeezed for skilled labor, for labor recruits at the moment, didn't know about employment organizations or folk who could support people with wraparound supports once they were into training or into jobs. One of the things that we heard over and over again was, Jillian, it's insufficient for you to provide support to someone until they get into training or into a job because actually once they're in training or in job, those problems of housing or mental health, et cetera, can continue. We need you to continue to help us. We needed to explain that we didn't have funding that extended beyond that. So what we found was a, were groups of people who were keen to participate and be helpful to one another, but didn't know how to do that. And so part of what we're talking about is systems change is to enable them to learn through this prototype how they can work together and how they can together overcome some of the barriers. Did you have and how, how is this a prototype and how do you see this program phasing over time? So we have the 100 people that were in the room that day in essence said they would give us their support in prototype, giving this a go so that we could demonstrate how they could work more seamlessly together. So what we're looking at in the, the proposal you have in front of you, uh, we're requesting $300,000 to support us in actually doing the linking work, hiring some of the trainers. Um, one of the big um, challenges in the 21st century is that we have a, a large portion of the Canadian population, and actually in the Western world this is a problem, who do not have the literacy proficiency, they can read and write, but aren't, don't have the proficiency that you need for jobs in the 21st century. So part of the, those dollars would also go to, in, to hiring folk who do essential skills training, upgrading, uh, problem solving, literacy, numeracy, so that they are able to take on the training of the more sophisticated uh, jobs. So part of the dollars would go towards that. And then there's a small portion for rental of some office for some space to do this work. And how do you see, what, what is the impact of a youth that would, would participate in this program? What kind of long-term impact would it have on their life? And, and also, can you tell us about the research behind this? So with respect to long-term impact, one of the things that we find uh, people living in poverty is, of course, there's an erosion of confidence. Um, and once people get into training and they get a job and they start to earn some dollars, um, they are now developing the skills that and the confidence and uh, the ability to actually take those skills to other places. So we are developing a skilled labor force, not just for today, but also for tomorrow, much very transferable skills. Um, the other thing is that from the employer's point of view and from unions' point of view who are doing recruitment into some of the skilled trades, they're beginning to figure out who these services are in the community that they can tap into in order to be able to actually bring uh, skilled labor in. And we're working with the University of Toronto at Scarborough through your anchor TO program and your own staff to help the University of Toronto understand that it's got barriers built into some of its hiring practices that it doesn't mean to, to have built in there, that it needs to change in order to be able to um, reach out to the local community. So these are long-term changes that we're talking about, Councillor McKelvey. We're not talking about a program, we're talking about changing the way in which the work is done so that in future, this centre perhaps won't be necessary. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. Thanks very much for the deputation. Um, looking forward to reading this. Um, this looks fantastic. Thank you. Um, what are some of the specific challenges that you've found through your research uh, that youth face uh, in trying to connect into the job market here? So one of the big challenges, and I've just referred to it, is the lack of understanding of each of the players about each other. So there are all kinds of interesting myths that people have about unions and who gets into unions or even where the front door is if you're interested in being in a skilled trade. Equally, employers have a notion that people living in poverty are there for all kinds of reasons I 
you know, that I don't care to mention. And yet, people living in poverty are people, for whatever reason, have fallen on hard times, are perfectly capable of developing the skills. And once we put people together in a room, it is extraordinary the way in which some of those barriers and some of those myths about each other start to dissolve, and the power of working together starts to come to life, shall we say. So we put the CAO for the University of Toronto at Scarborough in the same room as the empo employment counselors so that he and they can understand each other directly. We put the union folk in the same room as the employment counselors and the wraparound supports people so that they can understand each other better. A lot of this has to do with good old-fashioned relationships and myth-breaking. Um, two things. Uh, you, you just mentioned it there, and I'd seen it, the, the wraparound supports. Could you just elaborate a little bit on what that is for me? Absolutely. So if you're living in, in poverty, you have a precarious existence, you've got uh, child care or elder care issues, uh, you're being evicted from your home, um, you ha maybe have a criminal record so that you've got issues with probation officers, etc. The wraparound support, the system of social services that we have at the moment, supports a person when they're in crisis, but doesn't sort of hang out with them when they're going through a, a positive transformation. And so what we're finding is, uh, uh, and a number of employers talk to us about the fact that you, you guys will get them all nice and um, stabilized, and then the first time they run into an issue where the probation officer, they've got a probation appointment and it's gonna interfere with their work schedule, they freak out because they don't have the problem solving skills or the support to change that appointment. Whereas if they had a counselor that was still paid for to work with them, they could call up the counselor and say, I've got this problem, and the counselor could say, oh, no problem, I'll talk to your probation officer and figure it out, or this is how you can figure it out. So it's a matter of basically what we're talking about is leveraging the services that already exist so that they have much more impact. We multiply the effect, and there are obligations already on the, on the part of many of these uh, public institutions to have community benefits agreements, and they need to understand better how to actually implement those so that they can bring the local jobs to local people. S sounds smart. Uh, just last question. What's the, um, have you guys already done work to develop like a roster of employers and partners that would be on board for this? Yes, indeed. And, uh, and actually in this proposal, you'll see that we've got the University of Toronto at Scarborough is all over this, just waiting for us to start the pipeline, as it were. One of the things that has turned my head with respect to my, this particular opportunity is we're talking about real jobs that are being created, not jobs that may be created according to labor labor market forecasting, these are real jobs. University of Toronto at Scarborough is in, as is Automatic Coating, which is a reputable uh, local manufacturer that is happy to participate in this prototype so that, they, that we can train folk, or people can be trained and supported to learn how to spray, paint, coat. I'm not quite sure about the details of that. Jillian one. Najib, thanks very much. Thank, thank you. Jillian uh, Sumi. Before I begin, can I have some more time if I need to speak, please? Thank you. She's wondering just if her her um, deputation goes a little bit longer than five minutes, if it's okay if she keeps speaking. It's not a long deputation, but just if it takes her a while to get through it. Okay. Thank you. Hello, counselors. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today about the, two, the 2019 city budget. My name is Jillian Sumi, and I have lived in Scarborough all my life. I am here today to speak about how the 2019 city budget affects affordability for transit users in Scarborough, especially those living on a low income like myself. I am an ODSP recipient and, recipient and therefore live on a low income that is well below the poverty line. After paying for my rent, which is subsidized, but still, I, but still, it helps. I still need to have money. I am left with an extremely low amount of funds to cover essential expenses like food, clothing, exercise, and everyday living. In order to get around, I rely on public transit. Taking transit is a real cost for me. Moreover, as a frequent wheel trans user, using Transit is something I really must plan. In April 2018, the city passed the Fair Discount Program, or what some people call the Low Income Pass. Thank you for keeping your promise to create this pass. It is good to see City Council introducing measures to address 
transit equity. That said, I believe the low income pass is inadequate and more needs to be done. First, the cost of the monthly pass needs to be lowered. For someone like myself living on ODSP, the current cost of the pass is more than one sixth or 17% of my monthly budget. Also under the program, a single fare is reduced by one third. However, the monthly pass is not reduced by one third. If it were, then it would be under $100, 97.50 to be exact. I believe the cost of, of transit under the low income pass should be reduced even more. Also, I see in the proposed 2019 budget includes funds to implement phase two of the low income pass. But under its current proposal, only people with childcare subsidies would be eligible and not those rece receiving housing subsidies as was promised. People with housing subsidies need this program. The second measure I wanna talk about is the two hour transfer program. Again, it is great to see that city council passed this. However, people with disabilities actually need more time to navigate the transit system. So I believe we should we should be allotted more time with the transfer program. The city needs to allot more resources to make sure that wheel trans users can fairly access the two hour transfer program. For riders like me with a physical disability, transit is our only option to access our city and it is often out of our reach. The last thing I wanna talk about is the TTC board's decision to approve a 10 cent fare increase in 2019. I believe this will unfairly punish low income transit users, many of whom are students, seniors, and pass holders. For a senior who uses the transit twice a day, that's an added $6 each month. This may not seem like a real cost, but it's, but it is for someone living on a fixed income or having no income at all. To, re to reiterate, the city needs to make sure the fair discount program is made more affordable and includes pe people with housing subsidies. The city needs to also improve the two hour transfer transfer program so people with physical disabilities can benefit from it in the same way people without physical disabilities. And finally, I urge you not to increase fares. At minimum, I believe the city needs to make decisions that do not further limit the choices of people who already face hardships. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Our next debutant is Debika Shaw. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Councillors, and Mayor Tory. My name is Devika Shaw, and I'm the Executive Director of Social Planning Toronto. As someone who represents an umbrella organization that serves the social sector more broadly, I decided to focus my comments today on higher level choices and values that we see reflected in this budget as it currently stands. I also hope to encourage you to consider the fact that it would be strategically and politically wise to make different choices than the ones represented in this budget and to continue building this foundation over the next four annual budgets in time for the next municipal election. All budgets are about choices and values. In almost every social dimension, 
from affordable housing and homelessness to the state of our shelter system in Toronto community housing to child care to transit to child poverty to long-term care to access to recreation to climate change our city is in crisis and only bold action can solve the problems of this magnitude but this budget certainly does not demonstrate the level of action that is required to make a significant dent in any of these issues the 10-year capital plan projects mounting and anxiety-inducing problems due to a lack of funds. For example, over 10 years, the repair backlog for Toronto community housing, which provides rental housing to some 110,000 people in the city, many vulnerable, will increase from 1.4 billion to a total of 3.2 billion. That will leave thousands of units at risk of being shuttered permanently in just a couple of years in a city that cannot afford to lose a single unit of affordable housing. And as Jennifer Pagliaro recently pointed out in the Toronto Star, this budget lacks sufficient funding for many of the things that Council has already approved, including city-run recreation, subsidized childcare, climate change action, discounted transit, and ravine cleanup. On one hand, 19 of our 26 councillors and the mayor supported the prosperity pledge. On the other hand, uh, several chose to vote down multiple requests for information from staff ahead of the budget, including whether the poverty reduction strategy can be implemented at existing funding levels. Strategies and pledges are not the same thing as tangible action. So it's time for a little honesty and transparency. This budget represents a choice to continue serving the wealthiest Torontonians over the majority of Torontonians, and especially over the needs of the poorest and the most marginalized among us. This budget continues the tradition of keeping property taxes extremely low year after year. This is in spite of the fact that we have the lowest property taxes in the GTHA um, and Ottawa. For the average homeowner, the proposed inflationary increase costs $8.67 a month, less than your Netflix sub subscription. Imagine what kind of city we could build with a $20 monthly increase instead while proactively protecting seniors and low-income residents who cannot afford such increases. The budget also chooses to keep the TTC at one of the least subsidized levels in North America. We're at a stage now of having to pray to the TTC gods every morning before we leave, after leaving double the amount of time to get there, pack like sardines in bed bug infested trains. And what a huge economic drain this is to our city and, uh, and also has impacts on public health. Yet the current budget contains 24 million in unknown TTC cuts this year and there's a 17 billion in unfunded capital projects including new buses and streetcars, but basic maintenance and other state of good repair expenses. The budget chooses to continue to avoid raising money through new creative revenue tools through the City of Toronto Act, such as an increase in street parking fees or reinstating vehicle registration tax to expand transit services in Scarborough or luxury hotel taxes to support affordable housing. On the other hand, the budget chooses to increase recreation user fees by 4.07%, impacting thousands of seniors and low-income Torontonians who depend on these opportunities for their health and well-being. The budget also chooses to provide hundreds of millions of dollars in property tax breaks to developers for constructing commercial and industrial facilities, even though in many of these cases, generous incentives provided to developers have not resulted in, in sufficient public value. The budget also chooses to allocate $2 billion to the 10-year capital budget for the gardener for the benefit of the Torontonians who can afford the cost of driving into the city every day. Why do more affluent Torontonians matter so much more than those who need affordable housing in this city? Overall, this budget represents a choice to increase inequity rather than to reduce it. And I would argue that when, you are make, when City Council is making its political calculations, based on the key question of what do the majority of Torontonians want, especially those who are planning to vote in the next election, that the political calculations might be changing four years from now. Why? Because the city is at a breaking point, and the impact is being felt not just by the most marginalized, but even by the majority of Torontoni Torontonians. The homeowners... Yep, the homeowners and the drivers as well. So I'd like to ask you uh, to consider that. Thank, thank you. Your time is up. Okay. Questions? No, thank you. John Mason. Five minutes. Thank you for the opportunity to appear, Madam Chair and Councillors. My name is John Mason, President of Friends of Guild Park and Gardens. We're an award-winning volunteer group 
that's organized hundreds of public events at Guild Park in Ward 24 over the past seven years. Guild Park is a place where art meets nature. It covers 88 acres along the Scarborough Bluffs with gardens, forest, and shoreline. Guild Park also displays the city's unique collection of outdoor public art and historical um, architectural pieces. Each season, people from across the city visit Guild Park to enjoy art festivals, live professional theater, tours, and other activities. We collaborate closely with our councillor, Paul Ainsley, with uh, Guild Park officials and other park users, and even Meritori came out last July to open our season of professional performances. Our, me our message to the Budget Committee is simple. To make the case for continued investing in, at Guild Park. The goal we share with all Guild Park stakeholders is ensuring everyone who comes to Guild Park enjoys the same high standards available at other major parks in Toronto. I'm pleased to report on Guild Park's progress so far. When our group started in 2012, Guild Park was in rough shape. The old Guild Inn had been boarded up for more than a decade and was deserted. Then the city and a private partner invested more than $20 million to restore the original Guild Inn. Next, Parks, Forestry and Recreation started long-term plans on long-needed improvements. Last year alone, Parks put, in, put into place uh, such actions as opening two new forest boardwalks, upgrading the park's electrical system, installing lights, and making a drinking water station available to the public for the first time in a decade. Economic development and culture is also making Guild Park a priority. It's adding a new $5 million arts building to bring new public programs and more people to the site. To integrate and upgrade all of these park features, PFR has completed detailed plans to improve the trails and gardens and to operate both more cost effectively. The garden plan itself started in November by planting two historic Vimy oak trees done in cooperation with the federal government. These Vimy oaks are important symbols for Canada and an important new park feature. With all this activity, visitor counts at Guild Park have grown astronomically. In the past seven years, they've increased more than 10 times. This includes the 10,000 park visitors who come each year for volunteer activities, plus more than 68,000 people who came to the restored Gildan Estate last year for weddings, conferences, and special events. We congratulate the city for having the vision of Guild Park as a popular destination and for committing the resources to make that happen. Our concern now is that many park projects won't continue this year due to lack of funding by, for PFR. Without this funding, much of the work already done won't be of much benefit to Guild Park visitors. For example, few people are aware of the new boardwalks because there are no maps or signs to give them directions. Many of the pathways that are lit at night are too narrow or too steep for everyone to use. The new water station and the Vimy Oaks, they remain unmarked, so visitors don't know about them. Compared to other G Toronto parks, Guild Park still lacks basics such as enough park benches, convenient garbage cans, or having descriptive signs. There are many signs at Guild Park, but they tend to give warnings, not information. Most walkways are unimproved, unmarked, and underused. Our ask for this year's budget is to include funding so work continues to go forward on Guild Park's trails and garden plans. The city park professionals can provide an exact number uh, to keep this work going. For longer term funding, we recommend an idea that committee members have heard from Park People, Scarborough Community Renewal Organization and others, and that's to provide Guild Park with better access to the city's Section 37 funds. This gives an opportunity to link revenues generated by our growing city to a popular destination park that's benefiting more people across Toronto. Can you please wrap it up? One paragraph. Applying these best practices will ensure Guild Park becomes Toronto's destination that's spectacular, sustainable and accessible to growing numbers Thank of city you. residents for generations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? No? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.
Our next debutant is Siddharsana Sritas. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. I apologize if I didn't. Okay. You have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Siddhar Sinasridas. I'm president of the Scarborough Community Renewal Organization. Scarborough Community Renewal Organization, or SCRO for short, is committed to realizing bold visions to renew Scarborough by leading the, impl uh, leading the implementation of the recommendations of the Scarborough Renewal Campaign carried out in 2014 by Scar Scarborough's Rotary Clubs. Upon the release of the campaign, the mayor had asked us to identify three priorities uh, for him to champion through his office, and since then we have presented them. I think today is a good a day as any to recap these priorities as they may be considered for implementation in this year's budget. First ask is 3,000 municipal jobs back to Scarborough. If the thought behind this is if more city staff worked in Scarborough, particularly those in senior or policy making roles, these staff would understand firsthand some of the um, challenges that Scarborough faces. This would also turn Scarborough Civic Center into a significant governance hub and is aligned with the much needed public transit improvements in Scarborough. The second ask is funding a feasibility study for an art center in Scarborough. I think most of us know that Scarborough arts and culture community is very vibrant. There's multiple, countless uh, examples of that, but it operates with limited public infrastructure which inhibits its growth and exposure. An arts facility can be a solution, especially if it's located in Scarborough, but would serve all Torontonians. The third ask, and it's been uh, elaborated on by Jillian Mason, is the development of an East Ends training center. This third priority was identified at a SCRO-led community summit attended by 170 engaged Scarborough residents from 18 community associations as well as students from UTSC. Residents converged on this one priority recognizing that significant public investment in Scarborough is underway. Billions of dollars proposed to transit infrastructure by the city and its partners. 170 million investment planned for the Scarborough storefront. 85 million for the Medaway project, and 500 million for UTSC campus's expansion, and also um, investments um, in the Scarborough Health Network. Not to mention the need for need of housing as Scarborough's population grows. It is important that Scarborough's residents have the skills and training needed to seize these job, opp job opportunities, so as Scarborough grows, so will the residents. An East Ends Training Center will truly allow Scarborough to become a more complete community where residents can train, work, live, and play. Lastly, I would like to highlight the importance of investing in transit in Scarborough. All three of these priorities will, only, uh, will need a robust high-order transit system in Scarborough to be truly effective. Um, there is a plan in place and I think the city is right in funding and start building. Uh, many, of us, many of us experience the, how fragile the RT is, um, especially last week with it being shut down for three days. It's old, wore down and needs to be replaced and um, it's best that we continue to stick to the plan with an option to extend, uh, extend and make things happen. Thanks for listening and I hope these thoughts are uh, taken into consideration um, and the needs of the Scarborough residents are reflected in this budget. Thank you very much. We do have questions, Councillor Karajanis. Good afternoon, thank you for coming, especially regarding the arts. I did send an email to your organization, I'm not sure you, you have received Yes, we received it, it's just uh, the, the scheduled times that were proposed were okay. not uh, aligned so with our availability. You're aware of the ask of the, the group up in my part of the world and the offer that we've done for them and we'd like for you to participate and be in. I was only proposed of uh, a meeting, but um, we're happy to make that happen. Yeah. All right, so um, do certainly hope that you reach out back and set up a meeting. The, the ask is that a developer's uh, putting together a, uh, a complex up in my part of the world, and he's gonna be dedicating community space, and out of that community space, 5,000 square feet, will be going to a group in order to do a, an art gallery, art teaching, and all that stuff. We certainly would like to get you guys involved so we can have something like that in Scarborough. Great. So please do reach out. Okay, For thank sure. you. Councillor McKelvey. Thank you. Uh, we heard earlier from Jillian Mason about the support that's there for the East End Trade Center and that stemmed from the summit that you had. I was wondering if you could speak to the support that you have for an art center and the organizations beyond yourself that have expressed interest in that. 
So there are uh, support letters were sent um, with this idea. Um, Scarborough Arts was very supportive of this idea. Um, there is, an, again, they do a lot of amazing, great work, and we've seen that at Nuit Blanche and the, the Scarborough sign. Um, and they are also supportive of this idea of an arts facility. And, and in addition, to it, I, I think I've seen that there's also been letters of support from the Canadian Tamil Congress and other cultural organizations. I'm just wondering, can you speak to, we, we like to say in Scarborough that diversity is our strength. Um, how could uh, an arts center showcase that and really turn it into an economic driver? Well, the whole point is for the feasibility to look into that um, further, but I think from the way we envi envisioned it is that this arts facility would be a museum, would be a performance space, uh, or an arts gallery, something that is uh, caters to how diverse the arts scene is in Scarborough, so it wouldn't just cater to one specific type of arts, but almost um, a variety of arts. I can't remember what my question was for you. Okay, sorry, it was about... Uh, senior's uh, moment. Yeah, I know, senior's moment. Uh, oh, sorry, yes, your ask. I just wanted you to clarify. Um, your ask is not for the center. Is your ask for a feasibility study uh, for that? And maybe you can break that down a little bit. Yeah, so the ask is a funding for a feasibility study for an art center. Um, I think it's important to um, really have a consultative process when a consultative process when talking about what this art center will look like in the community. Um, and for us, we're a very we're a volunteer group, and I think it'll be best to have support and resources to fund a study that will um, really nitpick, like figure out what the, the art center will look like. Thank you. Our next deputant is Michael Manu. Good afternoon, budget committee members, councillors, and Mayor John Tory. My name is Michael Manu, and I'm the budget lead at the Toronto Youth Cabinet, the official youth advisory body to the city. I was born and raised in Kingston, Galloway, Orton Park. Since the budget launch, our team, along with youth from all areas of the city, have reviewed and discussed the budget to understand not only the potential impacts on youth, but also the grand scheme of Toronto's city building efforts. A common theme from youth engaged in the budget is that it is important that the city takes the necessary steps to ensure its future state is as great or better than current day Toronto. The reality is that this budget leaves a lot to be desired for youth who are envisioning a Toronto that truly commits to proactive and comprehensive city building. Our challenges around the operating budget are evident. The budget is a complex process, and I don't mean to take away from the challenges in preparing a balanced budget for the city. However, every year we go through the same exercise. We limit ourselves to an inflationary figure in property taxes and bank on a healthy land transfer sum, and then try to fit everything into that bubble. Unfortunately, taking that approach means that council approved priorities often miss the cut. The city is making decent progress through the full implementation of the Toronto Youth Equity Strategy, as well as securing funding through the National Crime Prevention Program to address the underlying issues around youth and gang violence. Another step is the funding of, uh, another positive step story is the funding of two new youth hubs, which have been very successful and provide a great safe space for youth. Ties needs to remain fully funded and the city in the future should take a proactive approach to fund initiatives around violence prevention before we have another year where it is too late to take meaningful action. There are some priorities that this budget clearly misses the mark on. The massive rec recreation waitlist cannot afford to receive funding for only 7,500 spaces out of the scheduled 20,000 for 2019. With the provincial government reducing funding to after school programs, this may put an additional pressure on city run programs. Likewise, the 2019 phase for reduced fare passes is also inadequate and lacks funding for those receiving housing supports. Although it appears that this delay may be logistical in nature, efforts should be taken to expedite the process and include funding for the full phase two rollout in 2019. Many youth who have engaged in the budget process have expressed concern in our dire capital plan. Apart from the massive capital backlog estimated for key city assets such as the TTC, transportation services, and Toronto community housing, it is disappointing that the Gardener appears to be the only city asset that has been given adequate funding to restore it to an acceptable level of repair. While tracks on the subway are cracking, and units in Toronto community housing are at risk of closing if the state of good repair backlog and funding gap is not addressed as soon as possible. This budget resembles a personal budget of an individual who is at the end of their respectable career but has failed to prepare for retirement. They have realized it and have probably started to panic. 
a personal finance advisor would tell them that it isn't too late to get back on track. While municipal finance is not quite the same beast as personal finance, I would argue that the, basic, uh, the same basic principles apply. Toronto has been very prosperous since the global financial crisis with an increasing level of development and investment in commerce. However, in the aim of limiting budget funding to an inflationary level, the city has failed to capitalize on this prosperity to ensure that Toronto's future state is set up for the same level of success and potential. This has led to a transit system that is tinkering on the brink of failure, a lack of support for our most vulnerable youth, and a housing system that young people in the city can literally only dream of participating in. We fear that it may be too late to address these issues the way we traditionally do things around the budget. To end my deputation, I would like to highlight something I saw in the Toronto Employment and Social Services budget. There is a reserve fund that provides computers to children whose parents receive Ontario Works subsidies. This reserve is scheduled to be depleted in 2021, and the notes state that alternative funding to continue this program will be required thereafter. In a labor market that heavily demands computer and IT skills, it is imperative that youth, especially our most vulnerable youth, have access to computers to prepare them for the future of work. Apart from addressing this funding issue proactively, we ask that you use this as an alert for future budgets. Relying on reserves won't cut it anymore. The city needs to show a strong commitment to youth, especially those most vulnerable, and a better future for Toronto by consistently funding initiatives like these. Thank you very much for listening to my deputation, and I'm pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Questions, Councillor McKelvey? Just very quickly, I think uh, Toronto Youth Cabinet has some great ideas. I'm wondering, are you also submitting a written, uh, a written deputation as well, and might you consider doing so? Yes, so we actually, uh, so I'll be submitting this um, to the Budget Committee, and we also have other youth around the city who will be uh, preparing their deputations, and we can submit that to the Budget Committee as well. Thank you. Yep. Oh, sorry. Yep, just very quickly. Councillor Bradford. Uh, thank you, Michael. Great deputation, and sounds like you guys really drilled down into uh, into the analyst notes and some of the budget stuff. Um, just curious, from the Toronto Youth Cabinet, what would you? Uh, you don't have to speak on behalf of the organization, but what what do you think are the top three priorities in the budget for youth? You talked you talked about recreation spaces, uh, fares, uh, phase two. Um, you talked about housing. Uh, talked a lot about transit. What would what would the top three be? I, honestly, it's because the Toronto Youth Cabinet is very diverse. I don't think it'd be fair to speak for... Give me your top three then. My top three? Yeah. Um, I think the recreation waitlist is very important. Um, not so much... Well, obviously, cutting down on the waitlist is, is, is very important, but um, providing programs is also a way for youth to be um, employed as well. And in my experience, especially with my... I have a younger brother. Um, seeing people um, from his community who are their camp leaders or their summer camp leaders or after school leaders um, in good positions and good jobs is another way to inspire youth to, um, to also look for employment in that sense. So that's, that's one key um, thing I would say is very important. The second thing I would say is the, the massive backlog for our city assets. It's, 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 very, it's, it's very egregious. You know, when I was reading the budget, the city manager's presentation and looking through the analyst notes, it's, it's a very concerning um, level of disrepair that a lot of our assets have. And um, I think priorities are also a big thing too, but if the city owns it, the city should maintain it. And I think that that um, mantra should be applied to everything and not just the gardener or, or specific areas. And then finally, I think personally, the third thing I would say is important for me uh, would be that, that reserve fund for um, computers. And I go to Waterloo, uh, I go to the University of Waterloo, but I live at home in Scarborough. I have two degrees from Waterloo and I'm working on my third. And in, in any, um, uh, faculty that you go to, whether it's accounting and finance, math, engineering, environment, and so on and so forth, uh, it's very important that we have um, uh, individuals who are trained. And in the 21st century, in 2019 and on, you need computer skills, you need Excel, you need Word, but you also need those specialized skills and those specialized programs as well. And so providing children with computers, um, you know, going through high school, going through elementary school, to prepare them for that is, is very important, especially for our most disadvantaged youth. Waterloo is a great school. Thanks for the deputation. Thank, Thank you very you. much. No, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you. Our next uh, deputant is uh, Robert McDermott. You have five minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Robert McDermott. I'm with Free Scarborough. Uh, with the limited time that I have here today, I wanted to focus on transit issues. Uh, Jillian brought up some good points here. Um, 
For 50 years, Warden Station has, has had no elevator or ramp. During that time, there's been several requests made, not, not only to politicians, but to bu city bureaucrats, uh, local city councillors, and nobody seems to want to uh, put an elevator or ramp in Warden Station. That means that people like Jillian in wheelchairs cannot use public transit. <coughs> and do you people care? No, you don't. Obviously, you would have put, it, you would have put uh, facilities in for these people. It's disgraceful. I called Mayor Tory, uh, Mayor Tory's office and was informed that elevators and ramps won't go in Morden Station until 2025. Well, you know, people like Jillian in wheelchairs, they have to get to work, to doctor's appointments, and things like that. Do you people really care? You're putting elevators in at, at, uh, at um, Woodbine, Coxwell, DuPont, Cape. All the Toronto stations are getting uh, the facilities they need, but we're not getting them in Scarborough. And you don't seem to care. The other thing is we're, we're, we're putting these passes up. We're, a pass in, in, in um, April will cost $151. Now, if you're riding transit in Montreal, you're paying $85. In Halifax, 78 In Edmonton, 97 why are we paying so much for, for, for transit here in Toronto? You should be looking at a visionary like, like the mayor in Montreal, Valerie Plant, who wants to reduce, reduce transit fares by 40% and eventually having free transit in Montreal. The government taxes health care and education. They should be able to tax transit as well. Gillian made some f fantastic points. The people who need transit, the less fortunate, the homeless, low-income people, they can't, they're not going to be able to afford it. They're, it's not sustainable to keep raising transit fares. Something has to be done. You need to look at other jurisdictions like Montreal. Look at Germany, where right now they're, they're considering making the whole country transit-free. That's the future. If you really want people to, to use transit, you want to get cars off the road, you want to improve the local economy, then you need to make transit affordable for everybody. Public transit should mean exactly that, public. Everyone can use it. But you're not doing nothing like that. All you seem to do is look after your own self-interest. It's not the way it should be. The other concern I, I have is the way money has been spent on, on, on capital projects, like the six station uh, line extension in line one. $600 million over budget, two years late. The Union Station revitalization project, $230 million over budget, two years late. The Regent Park revitalization project, $150 million over budget, two years late. Do you people not have any accountability at all? Don't you monitor these projects? Why are we going over budget by, by so much? You need an accountability office at City Hall to monitor your expenses. You're obviously not doing that right now. You've got a huge problem. And you come back to, to, to taxpayers and you say you want to raise water rates, you want to raise user fees? You want to raise property taxes? And another, another concern I have is our property taxes in Scarborough go downtown. We don't get them back for our own local communities and neighborhoods. They're going to pay for things like your dog walking park at uh, Royal Deck. $1.6 billion. We're paying for that. We're not going to get any use from a park like that. We need to get that money back to our own neighborhoods here in Scarborough so that we can fix our roads, so that we have our, our, our uh, sidewalks repaired, our parks are maintained. We have the worst transit in, in, the, in the GTA. Do you care? Can you wrap it up, please? You don't seem to care. We've got Scarborough politicians right here now. They, they don't care. They're supporting downtown's Toronto, uh, downtown Toronto's amalgamated agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? No. Okay. Barbara Shushak.
Peter Cortes. I've actually auctioned off a few of my five minutes here, too, so I'm making a little money today. Uh, I want to be quick. I mean, I appreciate the time. I appreciate everyone that's here. There's a, there's a lot of great stories. I'm representing the Greater Toronto Hockey League. That's, that's 15,000 hockey players in Toronto. Uh, we're definitely well known for our grads, and that's awesome, but I'm here more or less to represent our grassroots, uh, our programs that you don't hear about in the media, the kids' programs. A uh, few people talked about recreation, the 4.07%. Uh, if I'm here and I'll tell you I'll accept the 4.07%, a lot of people would say, Peter, you shouldn't do that. You can't speak for us. But let's just say we accept it. Uh, I want to speak to the fact that when it comes to budgeting, a lot of our programs are running on a very, very small scale. So retroactively putting fees to January 1st, or talking about 4.0 cent, it's time to start budgeting a little bit farther ahead. Uh, spoke to a lot of our house leagues that are running initiation programs. They're okay with bad news if they get that bad news and they can prepare for it. So if the 4.07 percent stays in place, uh, we're going to have to accept it, we're going to have to figure things out, but we would love to know that there's a plan that goes beyond one year because there's a lot of great recreational programs, kids swimming, soccer, hockey, not just the GTHL, that need to start planning for the future if we're gonna keep programs alive. And we have to make sure that our programs are not about middle class and upper class kids. Our programs have to be accessible to everyone at every income level. So that's it, I wanted to be quick for you guys. Uh, Hold on, hold on. I want to see if there's any questions. Questions? Just very okay. quickly, uh, do you have a perspective on arena board manage from the GTHL? Uh, arena board manage rinks versus city rinks? It was great that you got put on this one here, Brad, because I know your background with the city. Uh, the city, the board run rinks are owned by the city and people might know they're run by a community board. They will have people go out to sell ice and I know this 4.07, it says incremental, but you could probably put someone in the city of Toronto, and I hate to tell people how to do their business because when it happens to me, I cringe. Somewhere there's an opportunity for someone to sell space that has got empty ice. You're paying for the electricity in the rink, the staff. Someone can sell that ice at a reasonable cost instead of running them into a private rink and saying, look, we're gonna do better than what we forecasted because we're selling that empty gym, that empty ice pad that's already got someone being paid to work there. So that's where the community board ranks. They're filling their ice time. High school hockey, kids hockey, they're doing something right with filling their ice time. I think it's a good model. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And actually, uh, just to comment on that, um, Peter, as I, I have a board of management arena in my ward as well, and that's exactly what, what we're doing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, the next deputy is N uh, Nur Muhammad Ghazi. And then Shig Shaganthin Sibak. I can't pronounce that one. <laughs> oh yeah, we're Ooh. gonna do that after. Okay, Mr. Ghazi, you have five minutes. Thank you, madam. Uh, I came here today only for one issue, that is the water. I am Noor Muhammad Kazi, and I am a water right activist, especially rivers water. So I, am, I came here only to say something on water issue. It's the environmental issue. And Toronto is the global city and very much friendly, environmental friendly city. I like it, we like it, world like it. Uh, worldwide, it has its uh, reputation. Look the picture over there, the board. The Ontario Lake, CN Tower, 
and there is our mayor of the city. All are very much known all over the world. But I am a water activist, water right activist. Last election time, I met with Jennifer McElby. I asked, what is your background, educational background? I am a voter. And she said that I have the highest degree in environmental PhD program. I said, yes, we need you. I will work for you. And now she is here. Mr. Tori, you know me, I am from Bangladesh community. So 3% tax on water. I can tell many things on water. Without water, it is life. It's the blue gold. It's very much precious nowadays. Even the well in the Arab countries, big well tank, no. Water is the very much precious things of the human destiny, human development, human everything depends on water. We cannot tax it. I request our mayor, is the beloved, to everybody, decrease it. Decreasing councillor is good. Decreasing water tax is good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? No. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the next three deputants are from the same group. So what we're going to do is because we're going to recess in five minutes. So we'll, we're going to recess in a few minutes. So what I'm going to ask is that I've been asked if Anna Kim, uh, apparently she has to pick up her child and if she can go next. Anna? You want them to go first? Because, because we just have 10 minutes and then we're gonna recess. Okay, okay, go ahead, short and sweet. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sugantini. Thank you for giving us uh, this opportunity to talk about our budgeting allocation for children's recreational and out of uh, school program and af uh, affordable housing and transit. We are here, Sugandhani Sivakumar, Hanan Dada, and Nasreen Hakim from Dosit Park area, Ward 22. We are parent leaders with Middle Childhood Matters Coalition Toronto, which is an active, ac active group of social service agencies and community members working together to increase access to high quality out of school programs for all child children aged six to 12 in Toronto. My story goes to, I am single mom raising 12 years old uh, son living in uh, TCHC housing in Dosset Park. I wanted to talk about importance of funding affordable high quality and accessible out of school program in our neighborhood. A lot of people are newcomers and low income people and living in our neighborhood. S uh, since four years, we are emerging neighborhood. So that means low fund in our neighborhood. So we wanted to have uh, teach our kids in um, social skill, helping them build friendship and the most important things that they get away from street culture that is related to the violence and gang activities. Because after they stop the funding, our um, gang violence and uh, um, gang activities and violence raised so much in our neighborhood. And uh, every day, we are, people are scared to go outside because uh, gun violence are so much increased this four years. So we wanted to have good funding for recreational program for and after school program. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Hannah. As a Syrian newcomer father for a family of four, I have been living in Toronto for almost three years. 
and every day I struggle to meet my ends because life is so expensive here. It's important that everyone in Toronto has access to public transit. I want you to properly fund the TTC and fight to keep it publicly owned by the city of Toronto. Thank you. Nasreen. Hello everyone, my name is Nasreen Hakim. As a mother of four children, it's a struggle every month to meet ends meet and pay rent. Housing cost has skyrocketed in the past few years and the cost of living is so high for us low-income families living in Scarborough. We need affordable housing because it is our right to live in dignity in this city. Market price for a three-bedroom in Scarborough is 2,000 plus hydro and plus parking. And this is too high for low-income families. In the end, we hope that you will remember our asks as you take decisions on 2019 city budget. Families always want sustainable, affordable, accessible, and high quality programs for our children, six to 12 years in our communities. We want affordable housing and affordable transit options for working people. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? No, thank you very much. Okay, so we'll go to our last deputant before we recess, which is Anna Kim. Five minutes, please. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Anna Kim and I'm here to speak on behalf of the Scarborough Civic Action Network or SCAN. SCAN is a nonpartisan, community driven network whose aim is to help to mobilize a civic voice for Scarborough, one that is inclusive of marginalized and underrepresented communities and reflective of the diversity of community members who live here. SCAN is made up of 14 community serving uh, agencies across Scarborough along with neighborhood groups and resident leaders. SCAN is governed by its issue-focused mand action mandate, which is shaped by broad community input. For 2018 to 2019, Scarborough residents identified housing, public transit, and community safety as its three priority areas. Today, I would like to talk about the proposed city budget in relation to these priority issues. Residents told us more affordable, decent housing is urgently needed, especially for low-income tenants. Over 35% of Scarborough residents rent. More than 44% of tenants in Scarborough are spending more than one-third of their income on, sh on their shelter costs. Some people are even spending 50% or more of their income on just their housing. We see the impact of this. We see increase in food bank usage. We heard at yesterday's city budget forum uh, from numerous residents about the growing cost of housing. Beyond the high cost of housing, many tenants in TCHC and private buildings face maintenance issues and safety problems. People routinely face problems with heating, security, pest control, and feeling safe. The proposed city budget for 2019 does little to increase the supply of affordable housing or to support measures that would make affordable housing available as soon as possible. Some measures the city can take would include expanding on the Housing Now initiative and funding more housing development that includes deep affordability, uh, ensuring th uh, Section 37 money is secured and dedicated to affordable housing initiatives, implementing inclusionary zoning in Toronto. We also need to create a robust rooming house plan across the city that puts fundamental protections in place for tenants and allows for a legal avenue and right for designated persons on behalf of the city to ensure that legalized rooming houses are and continue to be safe and affordable for tenants with significant deterrence in place for serious infractions and of course, another important measure would be to prioritize the TCHC repair backlog and fund it properly so we do not risk losing pr precious affordable housing stock. Scarborough residents also told us more affordable transit is needed. Increasing fares without improved public transit will not be fair to the thousands of public transit users in Scarborough. We also need to make transit more affordable to encourage public transit use. It also needs to be affordable for those who can't afford to travel any other way, like Jillian shared today. Residents also want to see the two-hour transfer program expanded in Scarborough as people travel longer distances given the transit system and the larger distances we typically travel here. We also heard that the Fair Pass Discount Program, or the Low Income Pass, needs to better meet the needs of low-income transit users. Make the Low Income Pass more affordable and broaden eligibility to ensure those with housing subsidies can also access this program. We also need to see a rapid transit network built. We need to fund transit infrastructure that benefits all of Scarborough and reaches residents across the whole region, especially those living in transit deserts like Malvern and Kingston Galloway. 
Much has been said about the cost of, Scar of the Scarborough subway extension, and rightfully so, but little has been said about the fact that it will create no net gain in transit infrastructure, and thus make no movement on expanding the network to reach residents across all of Scarborough. We also need a budget that provides more support for vulnerable communities. We encourage the city to approve the funding request for the youth equity strategy, and to also fund more efforts to support vulnerable and marginalized communities. 73% of Scarborough's population is racialized, and, who are, and, and this population is disproportionately represented in poverty statistics. We also see this at food banks, drop-ins, mental health services. Pardon me. Sorry. We need a budget that works to remedy these inequities. More efforts are also needed to improve traffic safety for pedestrians. In 2018, more than 46% or 19 of 41 pedestrian deaths occurred here in Scarborough. Despite having 23% of the city's population and about 26% of its road kilometrage, pedestrians and other vulnerable road users in Scarborough are at higher risk of injury or death. The proposed budget allocates money to red light cameras, but more needs to be done to slow cars down. Can you Ensure that the up, city's please? Vision Zero is fully funded we hear that cars are running through stop signs, racing down streets. People feel afraid in their neighborhoods. Okay, we need a budget, a city budget that strives to improve the quality of life of much. everyone who lives in Toronto, Thank including you. the residents of Scarborough. Thank you so much. Councillor McKelvey has a question. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, uh, I didn't see you. Councillor Karajan Thank you, ma um, Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm not, I, probably I didn't listen or I didn't get it right. Are you supportive of the Scarborough um, subway? What we, are, what, what we have heard and, and, and what we have heard is that residents want to see a transit network that will benefit all of Scarborough residents. Sorry, are you supportive or not? We are supporting a transit network that will benefit all of Scarborough residents. <sighs> are you supporting of the Shepherd subway? We support a network that will support that will serve the needs of all residents across Scarborough. Let me ask you that, the other question. Then let me rephrase it. What would this network look like? What do you envision it looking like? Well, in the master agreement, the Shepherd uh, LRT East is part of the current master agreement, um, and and that would be certainly part of it. We've heard a lot of support for the Shepherd East LRT and the Eglinton East LRT, which needs to be funded. Okay. Th thank you. Thank you. Um, can I just have a motion that we can extend to finish asking the question because it's uh, five o'clock and we have to reset. Okay, Sorry. Councilor McKelvey. Briefly, because I know I'm between the yeah. break. Uh, what is your engagement strategy for your organization? Because it's quite broad. How do you get public input? Um, so last year, we, we basically um, surveyed residents across Scarborough um, using, we, we are a network consisting of 14 community serving agencies. So th with that infrastructure, we were able to reach out to uh, um, all across Scarborough and we conducted a face-to-face -face survey. Uh, we also did it online to get input on what they feel the priority issues are. And through that, you mentioned public safety, but did you, did your group have any specific recommendations around crime? Uh, reduction, no. prevention. Um, not not specifically, but um, there was a, there was a lot of talk about needing to support programs that uh, support vulnerable communities, and so so vulnerable communities, vulnerable youth. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a motion that the Budget Subcommittee for Scarborough and Etobicoke Civic Centre Public Consultations recess to 6 p.m. and remaining speakers registered for the 3 to 5 p.m. session be heard in the order listed when the subcommittee reconvenes at 6. All in favour? Carried. So we're recessing to 6 o'clock. <laughs>